Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Okay, so last week we talked about the stabilizer formalism. And so what we discussed more or less was the sort of stabilizer states, Clifford unitaries and Pauli measurements. And then there was the gottesman nil theorem, which says that uh, these can be um, these operations can be simulated in polynomial time on a classical computer. So now we're going to be discussing a paper by Aronson and Gottesman, where they, as the title suggests, they improve upon this algorithm, and then they also try to apply their techniques to some uh, other types of problems, namely slightly, in some sense, non-stabilizer type of circuits, where the states could be different, non-stabilizer states or the gates could be different and they try to simulate those as well and they put some bounds on the complexity given their algorithm and then finally if we have time they also discuss uh for example that the problem of simulating sim stabilizer circuits is in this complexity class parity l so let's just sort of more or less get started uh, so I just want to talk, uh, do some reminder from last time, which is we have this poly group. I will not take too much time on this subject, but for a single qubit, we had that this is roughly with some phases. These are the poly, uh, some phases times the poly matrices. Uh, I, X, Y, and Z. These are two by two matrices. Um, and of course, there are certain properties that I'll just say out loud, which is that they square to the identity. And if I take, uh, there's a group property so that if I take uh, any one of these and multiply it times each other, uh, you get another one. And also they either commute or anti-commute. So if I have some sigma, sigma prime, then we have that either sigma sigma prime equals zero or they anti-commute sigma sigma prime equals zero. And so this is for a single qubit. And then we can go ahead for n qubits. We have basically that this is a tensor factor of n polys. So it's going to look something like the following, um, Pn is equal to sigma one tensor all the way to n factors such that sigma i, for any sigma i, this is an element of P1. And so this, this appears to be correct. It will, this also includes the possible phases because each of the sigmas could have a different phase. Okay, let's also just recall what a stabilizer is. Uh, we have the stabilizers form a group. So if I have some Hilbert space, H, so given some Hilbert space H, we and we have that uh, some unitary, which is some unitary on the Hilbert space, and we have some state psi. Then a, a stabilizer is the following. If we have U times psi equals to psi. Now, uh, of course, stabilizers, so this is a fact, stabilizers form a group. Um, so maybe I didn't mention this last time because if I take two uh, unitaries that stabilize psi, then their product under matrix multiplication will, so, will also satisfy will also stabilize psi. The identity always, of course, i times psi equals psi. So we always have the identity. And also you can show that inverse are in it. So stabilizers form a subgroup. Uh, we more specifically are interested in, so what we want is the following. 
we want uh, stabilizers, stabilizers of some state psi intersected with the poly group. So we're only looking for um, states that are stabilized by polys. So, okay, so I will jump forward a little bit. I don't wanna to go too much into detail. So what we have is that a, a, um, a pure state, a pure stabilizer state, pure stabilizer state, psi is specified uh, is specified by a set of stabilizers like this. Let's call it S psi, which is generated. So if this is a pure state for n qubits, say, then I have uh, n generators, G1 to Gn. Uh, also, let's see some other things that we can say about this is recall that each generator, so we, we have the following sort of identity that if I take the polys and I sort of take out all the phases, I just look at only the poly operators without any um, minus sign or um, or plus or minus the imaginary unit then this is going to be equal to a set of bit strings. And in particular, uh, for the stable, for the polys that we're interested, those with just a plus or minus sign with no comp, uh, imaginary factor in front, we have that there's basically a mapping that looks more or less like this. If I have some poly that's described without any imaginary coefficient, then it can be uh, written as a bit string in the following sense. So I write RG is equal to it's, I have the X, this is one of the, so this is an, a vector with, this is an element of Z to N. And then I have another N length bit string that I call and I also, so this is also an N length big bit string. And also I have a single bit that just gives me the overall plus or minus sign. And then just R, G, something like this. So two, two N plus one. So this actually helps us quite a bit because we, because then we can translate this picture that we have here of the stabilizer group generated by, uh, this stabilizer group is generated by N independent polys, right? And so the, our, the way that we can check that these are independent, if you remember, is through this check matrix. And so I'm revising, I'm going back to some of this because we'll need to refresh our basics on this when we go to the Tableau algorithm of Aronson and Gottesman. So, because the, the crucial thing is that uh, for their algorithm, they take the check matrix more or less, and then they modify it by adding an extra N rows to it. And that's the sort of central innovation. Uh, so uh, the check matrix is an N by, 2n plus one uh, binary matrix. And it looks something like the following. We have, for each generator, we have a row. Zg1, Rg1. And so we have n rows. XGN, ZGN, something along these lines. And so we also have that. So we have that polys G and G prime, or say GI and GJ, 
which are an element of the stabilizer, but it doesn't have to be an element of the stabilizer. They commute if and only if we have the following thing holds. We have that R G I lambda R G J equals to zero. And if it equals to one, they anti-commute. Uh -huh. where if you recall, lambda is a 2n by 2n matrix, which is zero, I, zero. Okay, so I'm playing, so this is a, uh, a symplectic inner product, and I will just use some notation quickly, which I don't want to write this whole thing out, so I will just write this as a dot product, dot R, G, J is Sorry, there should be a transpose here. RGI, RGJ, transpose. Okay, so this is the symplectic inner product. Okay, so this will be useful now in our discussion of the Clifford group and also later in the Tableau algorithm. So we have that the Clifford group acting on a Hilbert space is a subgroup of the unitary group acting on that Hilbert space um, such that uh, for every H in the Clifford group, we have that H poly, uh, by conjugation, it maps a polys into polys. Something along these lines. And that's what's called the normalizer of the poly group. So this was a fact that I didn't mention last time. So and will be useful in proving the correctness of the Tableau algorithm. So I want to mention it this time. Clifford unitaries uh, preserve the symplectic inner product. Um, I'm not going to do the whole proof out now, but just to sketch the idea, we have that if G and G prime, which are polys equal to zero, and then you map this to uh, U, G, U dagger, or rather, uh, sorry, the basic idea is that if we have that G, G prime equals negative one to the R, G dot R, G prime, G prime G, you want to map this using the unitaries for each of these. So G, G goes to U, G, uh, U dagger, and G prime goes to U, G prime, U dagger. So you can do the same exact, um, you can try and find the commutation relations between the transformed polys, and you'll find that the transformed polys commute or anti-commute just like the original polys G and G prime. Uh, where is this coming from? Just remember that this inner product is zero if they commute. So you have that G, G prime equals G prime G. So this is equal to plus or minus one, depending on whether, whether they commute or not. So, which is exactly what we want. So I won't go too into too much further detail for this one. Okay, so now we can go to the Tableau algorithm.
So we're going to start with the original parity check matrix that we had before. And we will also uh, introduce another N rows. So we're going to let just a bit of notation S be the group that stabilizes psi, which I'm taking to be a pure uh, stabilizer state. And let D psi be the so-called destabilizer group. Uh, basically, the idea is that uh, when you, so um, S psi, the stabilizer group is a proper subgroup. Uh, and once you start acting on S psi by elements of D psi, you generate the whole polygroup. That's, that's the basic idea. And so what is our tableau going to look like? So hopefully this notation is, is easy to see. So we're going to look at the tableau that we had before. And I'm just going to break it up into blocks. So XD, I'm going to call this the block of X bits for the destabilizer part of this. And then XS, so let me just ZS, uh, sorry, ZD. And then this is uh, RD, RS. OK. So what we have is that this part is precisely the parity check matrix that we had before. And now, and I'm gonna tell you how to construct this uh, destabilizer part. Uh, it's, the, it's a carbon copy uh, in, sort, in the sense that you're just gonna have N poly operators there. So it's gonna be another, you're gonna concatenate another N by two N plus one matrix on top of that. So just to be precise, we have that rows one to N are going to be for the destabilizer, rows uh, N plus one to two N are for the stabilizer. Uh, okay, so if we take an initial state, so this will be the easiest way to see how to come up with a destabilizer group and a full tableau. If we have an initial state that we take to be psi equal to zero, what do I mean by zero? I just mean it's a bit string with all zeros, n times. So what's the initial tableau look for the, like for this one? This one will be something like, uh, the identity matrix on N and N by N identity, we have zero, uh, N by N zero, N by N zero identity. And then also these will be a vector of zeros. Uh, why is this the initial tableau? We remember uh, that the zero state is stabilized by Zs. That's why we have only Zs, so this is uh, all the uh, Zs acting on each qubit. So this will stabilize and this will stabilize this state. And the Xs here. Um, so if I have all of the Xs acting on each qubit from this, I can generate the full poly group because if I take, for example, the first row, which will be X acting on the first qubit. And then the first row of the stabilizer part, so this one, and then this one, I can generate X or Y or Z on, on the first qubit. So just using these uh, polys, I can generate any of the uh, full group. So let's see, there's some properties that we should notice. And one of these properties is that ri dot rj equals zero uh, unless 
i is equal to or rather sorry j is equal to i plus n so the only time so maybe i should give an example of this so if I look at a tableau for an initial um, state on two qubits, so this is for two, I will have something like the following, um, one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. Okay, so if I start with this is the initial tableau for uh, here psi is equal to zero zero, then uh, I can see that right here, this is the poly x on the first qubit and this is poly z on the first qubit and they anti commute so basically but poly x on the first qubit also commutes with the uh, poly z on the second qubit so you have that this property holds there they commute unless it's a precisely the index is n more than the current index i where i suppose i should also say that i is equal to one to n okay so this is actually something useful to remember because clifford you clifford unitaries will actually preserve this structure uh, because Clifford's, based on the proposition that I wrote before, because they preserve the commutation relations, there will always be this structure where when I apply a Clifford, um, that the if I pick a particular destabilizer and I go n entries down, it will always anti-commute with that one, but it will always commute with the others. So Clifford's preserve this particular structure. Okay, so now we want to actually get into how we do the, the algorithm. Uh, so first we're gonna introduce a subroutine, so-called by Aronson and Gottesman, which is called rho sum h comma i. And the basic idea is that this is the group operation between two, this is the group operation between two polys. Uh, what we want to do is uh, more or less we want to take a a row h and we want to make it row h plus i. Uh, the basic idea is that when you have two polys g g prime equals okay. So when you have two polys and you uh, matrix multiply them you want to figure out what the analog of that is in terms of adding. You want to be able to have a, a procedure for taking two, um, two rows, G and G prime, and make it, and it something like R, G, G prime. Uh, the problem is, Actually, this is not so hard to do. Um, you can, uh, one part of it is very easy. If I just want to look at how the actual polys change, then this is very simple. I can just add, so for example, if I have the following two entries, uh, one, zero, 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 and uh, zero, one, zero, zero. If I just want to add these, this corresponds to poly X on the first qubit, poly X on the second qubit. If I want to um, look at the matrix multiplication of these without, and you don't care about the phases, then I can just add, I can do the XOR of these two rows so that I do the XOR of the rows and I get that, I get a row that's one, one, zero 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 the problem with this of course is that um there are examples where the phase flips when you multiply so an example of this is when i do x x poly x on the first and second qubit times z z this equals minus y y 
So I need a scheme for keeping track of when to actually have this negative sign. And so that's what row sum does for me. It, it employs or utilizes the, uh, or it simulates rather, maybe is the better word, the poly group operation. So let's see how it works. So row sum hi, just so we have it on the same page. Uh, let's introduce a function g of z1, sorry, x1, z1, x2, z2. So it's a function on uh, two qubits such that Uh, or perhaps maybe I'll make it a little bit more explicit. Let's, uh, the input into this subroutine is a bit string. Um, it's a bit string x1, z1, x2, z2, four bits. And the output of this thing is g of these. So I'll just put a dot. And the output is G of X1, Z1, X2, Z2. And what is G? G does the following thing. And we will at least con confirm through an example that this works. So I call this just G of X for short. So this one equals zero when X1 equals Z1 equals zero. If x1 equals z1 equals 1, then this is equal to z2 minus x2. If it's equal, so if you have that x1 equals 1 and x, sorry, and z2, sorry, z1 equals 0. And we also have the case x1 equals 0 z1 equals 1. So this one will be z2, 2x2 two minus 1. And this one will be something similar, but flipped to z2 minus 1. OK, so let's just see that this more or less works. Uh, this is supposed to be a function, uh, and it's a nonlinear function, as you can see, which uh, sort of keeps track of the sign. So let's do the previous example that I just did. Say I have uh, Rxx is equal to uh, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and then R z z equals zero zero one one and then also zero uh what we expect is that uh when i do this sort of if i do the row sum of these two that i should get r r of minus y y so how does that come about so let's Let's see, one second, let's compute this function. Ah, sorry, there's an additional step. So once you compute this function, you do the following thing. Um, the new row, row H, sorry, the bit for the sign of row H is given by the following. It equals zero if, and we have this, more complicated function, 2RH plus 2RI. These are the, um, the rows that we're looking at, the bits for those, the phase bits. Plus J equals one, two, and G of X, I, J, Z, I, J, X, H, J, Z, H, J. 
So if this thing is equal to zero mod four, then our, then you set the bit, the phase bit uh, to be the phase bit for the new row that we will be defining. Uh, remember, we're taking H to H plus one, which in computer science, you know, you also, you abuse the notation. So H goes to H equals H plus I, something like this. So the new H that you could also call H prime is equal to zero if you have that this condition holds and it's, and R H equals one if this whole function, maybe that we call F, if F is equal to um, two mod four. So those, those are the two conditions and it will never be the case that it's uh, one or three. So we can just now look at the example. My apologies for, I skipped ahead. So when I look at this one, how can I compute this? See if I have the example here. Okay, yes, so I, I do have the example. So let's work out here. We have that uh, RH is equal to zero RH equals RI equals zero. And then, so if you go through and look at the G functions, okay, so maybe we just do this out one time. So, Mm -hmm. X one one is one and then Z one. Yeah, so this one is one zero and this is zero one. So this is one of the functions G that we have to sum over and there's two G's. So in this case, G one zero, this tells us that we need to compute Z2 times 2X minus one. So this one will be equal to one if, and for the second one, because the sum has precisely two terms here for N, so there's two terms here. So we have also again, one, zero, zero, one. And this is also equal to one. So the whole thing is F in this case, sorry, something is not quite right. Let's see here. Um, okay, when I look at this one, Z2 is one, but X2 is zero. And so this is minus one. And then, so I do that twice. So I have two, F is equal to two. Okay, yes. So F is equal to two mod four. So that means we set the new bit to be equal to one. So we have that our new row is given by XORing the XORing precisely these pieces. And then also, uh, taking the phase bit. So we have that R new is equal to one, 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 and then the phase bit one, which is precisely uh, what we said before. This should be R, this is R minus Y, Y. Okay, so it's, 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 it's a whole procedure and this is supposed to be done in the computer, but you can also do it by hand. For us, it's easier to just uh, multiply the polys, but in a computer, that's not necessarily the easiest thing to do because actually you're multiplying, doing matrix multiplication and that's actually uh, quite costly, like maybe order of N cubed steps. So this, this will actually in the computer be faster. Mm 
Okay. Okay, so now how does the tableau work? So we, we did this row sum, which is a subroutine. Now, if we want to do some, uh, some stabilizer operations, we have a couple of types. We have the gates. Now, how do the gates work? Uh, actually, the gates work more or less just like they did in the original Gotsman nil paper. Uh, all you really have to do is mm, more or less, sorry. Okay, so the gates, let's just write them out one by one. So say it for the Hadamard, how does it work? Let's say this Hadamard acting on the eighth qubit. How, how do we actually do something with the Hadamard acting on the eighth qubit? So for all I in one, two, two N, we do the following procedure. I, we set Ri equal to Ri plus Xia Zia. This is how you take care of the phase bit. And then also you XOR, uh, you XOR only, sorry, you don't XOR, you just swap Xia goes to Zia. And, and this makes sense, right? Because the Hadamard precisely does this. It flips the Xs and the Zs uh, and vice versa, Z. So maybe I can just do it like this. So this is how you apply the Hadamard gate. If I want to do the phase gate, I do some acting on the eighth qubit. I do something similar. So again, for all okay, one, two, two N. How do we actually implement this in the tableau? We go for set, we let ri equals to ri plus modulo two, xia, zia, same thing. And we do the following. ZIA equals ZIA plus XOR with XIA. Um, so we could work this one out. It's not too bad. So for example, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it is just good to see, make contact with what we expect. So P, Z, P, here P is the phase operator. Uh, dagger, this one is just equal to Z because P is diagonal uh, and Z is also a diagonal matrix. So we expect something like this. How does that work in this formalism? We have that Z looks like the following, zero, say that there's two qubits, one, zero, zero. So how do we modify this under P of say, this is on the first qubit. So if we apply this on the first qubit, we take R equals zero plus zero. So it does not modify the, that piece at all. And then what it does do is it adds, it adds an X piece, which is not here. So we have again that Z, so Z, two, rather Z1 equals uh, one, sorry, one plus zero, which is just the same thing that we had before. So it leaves it unchanged. That's a rather simple example. Okay, and then the we also have the C naught gate, which I will just write as C of on acting on A and B, A is the target, or sorry, A is the control, B is the target. How does this one work? So for I in one, two, two N, uh, how do we control the phase? Ri is equal to Ri plus, 
XIA sub. This one is a little bit long to write out. ZIB times XIB plus ZIB, ZIA, sorry, plus one. Okay. And we have just that XIB equals XIB plus ZIA, which makes sense. We only is that no, hold on. It looks to me like it's ah, okay. XIB plus XIA and ZIB equals. Z A plus Z I B. These should all be modulo too. Okay, yes. Okay, so those are the gates. And actually the uh, difficult part is to implement the measurements. So let's let's take a detour into that. Uh, so just recall, uh, how does this work? So for the original Gottesman nil protocol, the sort of algorithm that's implied by the, the theorem when you just write it down is to essentially, uh, if I want to do a Z measurement, uh, one of the things I have to do is I have to first check if the measurement will be random or not. So if I just have some sort of, uh, okay, I will. Um, okay, something like this. Uh, so how did this measurement protocol work? First, what you have to do is you can check in a rather short amount of time whether, say, I want to measure Z on the first qubit, on the first qubit. So uh, what I first need to do is just check whether any elements of the stabilizer uh, have an X in them. Because if there's an X, then it will be the case that uh, the stabilizer state will not be an eigenstate of Z on that qubit. So you can check in a rather short amount of time whether the outcome will be random or not. But then the question is, you have to figure out, okay, well, if it's not random, how do I actually know, uh, how do I actually know what the, what the outcome will be? And so what you have to do then is actually take, well, in the original one, without the destabilizer um, tableau, you have to take, you have to take the stabilizer part and you have to do a Gaussian elimination so that you put it in some row reduced form. And when you put it in row reduced form, you can actually uh, find out what the relative, what the sign is by just doing the proper manipulations. So that ends up taking something like in the original, it's uh, they say something like order of n cube because that's how long it takes to do Gaussian elimination. Uh, so one of the motivations here is to reduce that sort of overhead. And uh, the way to do that is that you're going to be able to sort of track the signs more easily without doing a full Gaussian elimination using this row sum. So there's two, there's two basic um, cases to consider. Again, case one, which is when you have random outcomes. Uh, and this is the statement is the following. Uh, so there's a P in the rows N plus one to two N such that X P A. So we're measuring the eighth qubit is equal to one. Okay, this is precisely what I was talking about. Uh, you want to look at the stabilizer part of the tableau. And if there's any one where the X is present, then it will be random. 
Uh, so if there's more than one, just pick the, the least uh, index wise, the least of them. So if there's such a P exists, then the state will be disturbed and the outcome will be random and we need to update the state. So how do we update the state? Is done as follows first. Call row sum of, got to get the order right, I comma P uh, for all I not equal to P such that X I A equals to one. Um, okay, I'll, I'll explain what's going on here in, in a second, but more or less, so this is, how can we understand this for all I not equal to P? Okay, let's let's keep going. So what we do in the next step is flip a fair coin. This will simulate the outcome of the measurement, which is going to be random. Uh, set the p minus nth row to p, and I will explain this in a second, and then set the pth row to z a. This is for measuring a uh, the in the computational basis for the eighth qubit. So what are we doing here? So if the measurement is random, remember, what we have to do is replace the measurement that it, uh, the poly that it anti-commutes with, with the one that it commutes with. So uh, so what you need to do is, and also the tableau works by having the minus, so if I take some index, the minus nth one needs to anti-commute with it. So what do I do? I take the one that I know will anti-commute with uh, Z A, I put it in the P minus nth row, and then I take the one that, and I take the row that I've, the qubit that I've measured on, I replace it with Z A, which is going to be just a one in one of the Z entries. And also I, I set R of P equal to the measurement outcome. Say I got M flip a fair coin and get M, then I set RP equals to M. Uh, ah, yes. So this, this initial step, uh, if you're wondering what it is, it's the step in where um, you want to set up the generators so that they all commute with the new one. So you just, this row sum is just performing matrix multiplication on all the other rows. So that's that's essentially what you're doing. It's more or less getting the generators in the proper order. Uh, let's see, no time for, okay. So let's do the next case of a determinant outcome. Uh, so in this case, uh, such a P does not exist because they all commute. Uh, there does not exist a P, uh, P such that X P A, sorry, X P A equals to one. That is they all commute. So how do you perform? So uh, consider introduce a, uh, a 2n plus first row. This is just for scratch space. And then what you do is uh, for every i in one to n, where x i a equals to one, what do you do is you perform the row sum
I comma, sorry. No, you're updating the, the scratch space. So you always leave the scratch space uh, the same and you just keep updating it, I plus N. So now we're just trying to find the sign. So what we're gonna do is we're going to multiply together all the destabilizers that anti-commute with um, the anti-commute with the measurement, the generator that we're looking at. And the outcome will be uh, so, and then at the end of this, and we'll do an example, R of 2N plus one will be the outcome of the measurement. The outcome of the other measurement is already determined, but we need to find out what it is just by looking at the tableau. So will be the outcome. Measurement. So let's let's do an example. So say we have some T that's of the following form. Uh, say that there's two qubits. So you have one, one, zero, zero. This is just some random example. So say you have zero, one, zero, 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 one, one. Zero, zero, zero. And then a final scratch space of zero, zero. Uh, so you want to, if you just look at the algorithm, uh, you 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 come up with the 20, uh, 2n plus first one, and then look at all the i in uh, one to n such that xi is equal to. So let's say we do a measurement on the first qubit, then we only have the first row to consider. And then, so, and then what we wanna do is perform row sum on the last one and the i plus n. So here n is two and the first row is i is one. So we wanna do row sum on on the fifth and third index, which if you do it out, actually, you will see that this turns out to be that the function f that I mentioned before, this will be zero. And so you have that r, the outcome of the measurement will be equal to zero in this case. Uh, if we did it quantum mechanically, how could we see that this is the case? Uh, the stabilizer that I have, this is just an initial tableau. Actually, you can just see that here, psi is just equal to zero, zero. And so if I measure plus on this, so if I measure Z on this, it should just give me Z1 on zero, zero is zero, zero. Okay, so that's uh, this is kind of a trivial example. So in more complicated examples are possible, but it's probably not worth doing it out by hand. So now we wanna also show that this procedure is correct. So uh, in order to do this, let's just recall that we have this, this proposition. which is the following, the following are equivalent. Oh, sorry, R wrong proposition. The following are invariants of the Tableau algorithm. So we have the following. So R R n plus one to R two n generate S. 
and R1 to Rn generate uh, D. Another statement is the following that R1 and Rn, R1 to Rn, as well as Rn plus one to R2n commute. Uh, also, you have that for all, uh, we also have something that I said before that the only ones that anti-commute are if you have R, I, and R, I plus N anti-commute. And, and they otherwise, they commute. Okay, so uh, that you can prove this is not so hard to see. You just set up the initial uh, tableau that I had maybe up here somewhere, something like this. You can see that it holds here. And then you use the property that I mentioned before that Clifford Unitaries preserve the symplectic inner product. And you see that, so no matter which uh, Unitaries I pick, uh, I will actually have that this will be the case. And also, uh, I also made sure to mention, and we will prove that the measurement updates will also be in variance of this. So Clifford's preserve this. The okay. So let's let's prove that this is actually correct for deterministic outcomes. Uh, so in this case, you have that ZA commutes. So this is the, uh, the measurement that we're doing on the eighth commute. Uh, qubit commutes with S. Uh, that means that when we write it in terms of the rows, uh, in terms of bit strings, we can write it as follows. We have C h equals 1 to n, c h, uh, r h plus n. So we can write it in terms of the stabilizers, and this is equal to r z a. So we can write it as a linear combination. So we can also use the fact that, so what do we want to do? We want to actually uh, find what these coefficients are. To find what those are, just notice the following that, uh, well, we can use the inner product, which is going to be that R I comma R dot R H plus N is equal to delta I comma H plus N, right? So we know that either they uh, commute or anti-commute and they only commute when, um, sorry, this is probably just H then, okay, yeah. Uh, when I is equal to H, that's the only time that they anti-commute. So I can actually use this to find the coefficients here. So CI is equal to, the inner product of sorry. Uh, okay. Okay, yes, sorry. This is what I was trying to do. If I take some i and I take the inner product with z with the row ZA, then that's going to be something like sum H C H R H plus N. So we can see that this will apply the Delta when I bring it in here. So that's how I get the coefficients. Uh, and then, so, that gives me the coefficients. Why does that help me get the 
sorry, I one second. Uh, the ZA commutes with this. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. So here, here's what we're trying to do. Uh, trying to get my bearings. Uh, in the determinant case, we took for all i equals 1 to n, where xi is equal to a, and we performed rho sum on those. So now what we're actually just trying to do is, is find the phase. And uh, the only ones, so we want to rewrite, uh, we want to rewrite Z, ZA in terms of the generators that I already have. So that's what I'm doing right here. And that will help me figure out what the sign is. So uh, now that I know that RZA is just given in terms of a linear combination of certain generators, I only want to include those generators that are not that have uh, non-zero coefficients here. And those are precisely the ones that anti-commute. Uh, so then what I want to actually do to find out what the what the phase is here is then I just perform row sum for each of these because that'll actually give me uh, include the the phase. So then if I just perform row sum by just essentially uh, what is row sum doing? It's just multiplying poly it's telling me how to do the group operation of multiplying the poly matrices. Uh, so I just perform the row sum 2n plus 1 and i plus n. And when I do this, this will, at the end of it, the phase of this, uh, the phase bit will tell me the phase, the outcome of the measurement. Okay, so that that's actually, so why is this helpful? This is actually one of the key outcomes of the so I don't have to do a Gaussian elimination. In fact, I'm just doing uh, a certain amount of matrix multiplications n squared of them. So this is order of n squared, which is better, which is obviously better than than the n cube that you need for Gaussian elimination. Okay, so. That, that part was maybe not explained the best, but basically the idea is that uh, you can basically know that ZA, if it's inside of the stable, it's inside the stabilizer, then you know that it can be written as a product of polys that are inside the stabilizer. That's the same thing as writing it as a linear combination of the rows. Uh, and the only terms that we are interested in here are the ones that uh, are the ones that are non-zero. So we can find this these non-zero ones. They're precisely the ones the that anti-commute. And so when you actually do the group operation for just those, that's done by performing row sum, and that's how you get the phase bit. Okay, so that's that's one thing that you can do, but then you can ask the following question whether you can go beyond stabilizer circuits. And they consider three possible ways to go beyond uh, the stabilizer circuits. So the first one is going to actually utilize the, the Tableau method, whereas the other two are gonna be more or less uh, quantum mechanical in the formalism. So the first one is that you can consider subspaces. Stabilizer subspaces, maybe. Uh, so Aronson and Gottesman call these uh, mixed states. They're not the most general possible mixed states, right? So that's it's a little bit confusing. You can actually just think of these as being, uh, how does the Tableau algorithm work when you're looking at uh, stabilizer states that are subspaces of the Hilbert space? So how does this one work? You consider R less than N, so less than N qubits, where N is the number of qubits. Uh, 
Um, so you can look. So typically for a stabilizer state, a pure stabilizer state, you can write it as something like rho s is equal to it's psi psi, but also you can write it as a product of a product of projectors, right? Because precisely what it is, is you are looking at the mutual, the joint plus one eigenspaces um, of a product of polys. So you can just look at a product of projectors to find the subspace. In this case, for n qubits, uh, a pure state, it will be a one dimensional space. So this is one to n of i plus mi. Um, I, where MIs are polys. And of course, these are, uh, these, the MIs are, of course, the generators. So maybe I should say this S psi in this case is generated by M1 to MN. So we can consider a subspace in the following way. Uh, let rho equal one over two to the r. I'm going to use the coefficient that they did. I think that this is strictly speaking incorrect, and I'll tell you why in a second. So this is pi equals one to r of i plus mi. Yeah, so I don't think that this has trace. Um, this probably does not have trace one the way that they have it written. Uh, they could, of course, mean something else that is the partial trace of uh, a pure stabilizer state, in which case I think that this then makes sense in that, in that case. Uh, but if it's a convex mixture of stabilizers, which is the same thing, somehow this coefficient doesn't make as much sense if this is an operator acting on uh, the n-dimensional Hilbert space. So, okay, so how does how does uh, simulation work in this case? So you could, uh, one naive way to do the simulation is as follows. So there's, there's two uh, varieties that are mentioned. One is you could consider a purification. So if this is the partial trace of some, if this is the partial trace of some pure state, then you can purify it. Typically uh, in the textbook sort of treatments of purification, you have that, you have to double the Hilbert space. So that's a certain amount of overhead. Uh, that's one way to do it. You could purify it. And then you could go ahead and just track the uh, track the row under Clifford's and measurements by just applying Clifford's and measurements to the Hilbert space that you're interested in. So that's the purification. Or two, you could just supplement. You could supplement this uh, state with. You could supplement the generators with n minus r additional uh, additional poly generators. Uh, plus the the destabilizers ones as well. And so, what what are you doing in that case? You're kind of uh, embedding it in the same Hilbert space, and you can use the same Tableau algorithm. So you can just reuse the same 2n by 2n plus one uh, tableau in this case. So instead of purifying, uh, you have this r qubit subspace. Uh, then you just increase, uh, you consider enlarging the space by uh, adding these additional generators and you, you track the full tableau the way that you normally did, mo modulo just a, a, a certain change in the way that the measurements are updated, but more or less you can do the whole thing that you want. You just sort of apply the Clifford's 
and measurements to the qubits that are that are of interest, and you don't touch the other the other ones. So I think I will just, in the sake of time, I will just go to, there's only one complication for this. You can more or less do the same algorithm. Uh, the only thing is that the measurements, the measurements uh, are slightly different. And in this case, the measurements are different because, uh, so in the first case, you have that there's a random outcome, and this is the, uh, the same procedure that we used before. Uh, and then you have that there's a second case, which is that, that you do a measurement SZA, and ZA is in the stabilizer. And there's this third case where you have, you perform ZA and ZA commutes. Uh, so clearly if in the second case, if ZA is in the stabilizer, it commutes with everything. Uh, you have this third case where you measure ZA and ZA commutes with uh, the stabilizer. So let me just make sure. Uh, Yes, it commutes with the stabilizer, but not with the auxiliary. Um, N minus R stabilizers. So in this case, you have to, uh, you can do something similar. It will uh, disturb it will disturb the state because you're projecting onto a poly that's, it commutes, uh, that's right. So that's an important point. It commutes with S, but it's not in S. So that means that it will still disturb the state and you still need to perform an update, which is going to be similar to the update in one, which I won't go over, but that's, that's the third case. Uh, let's see, there's also some other cases that we can look at. And maybe I'll just go over these more or less quickly. So non-stabilizer initial state. This is another modif modification that goes past the stabilizer formalism. And this one will be something like the following. They don't pick the most general input state. They consider a ansatz for the state, which is going to be a tensor product I equals of M, M tensor products, where each tensor product is where row, each row I is, a, is acting on the Hilbert space of, or maybe I write it like this. Yeah, where each of these blocks acts on B qubits. So it's not the most general thing. So maybe I, I can write this M tensors of row I on B qubits. So we can perform unitaries and then we can consider. Uh, so they argue that without loss of generality, you can do the following steps. You can uh, perform some unitary, some Clifford unitary, perform, uh, and then subsequently do a measurement on the first qubit. And you can do, it suffices to look at these cases where, and then you do a second unitary, Clifford unitary, and measure on the second qubit, et cetera so that you have uh, these blocks of operations, U1, Z1, U2, Z2, all the way to UN, ZN. Mm -hmm. 
So let's see, uh, just to make the point a little bit clear. So when you do one, one iteration, you have something along the lines of U1. Um, why did I write it like this? Ah, okay, yes. So uh, what, what you more or less want to do is to understand how uh, the probabilities of the measurements work. So let's let's just focus on that for a second. So let's say that the measurement outcome is zero, and then we can consider the other case uh, similarly. So you have trace i plus z1 u1 row. Say that you perform the u after uh, you perform it, you do the measurement, and you want to see what the outcome of this measurement will be. Um, after some manipulation, you get that uh, because of the identity, you have a factor of one half plus one half trace of u1 dagger z1 u1 row. Uh, where this is obviously an, just another poly because we're considering Clifford operations. So uh, the question now is, how can we compute this? And it turns out we can rewrite this in the following way, which I will just skip some of the steps, uh, just to illustrate the point of how you get uh, the complexity of this version of, of this simulation. You can because this is a poly you can write it as a tensor uh, on however many qubits so i can write this whole thing as j equals one to m there's m tensor factors trace of pj rho j and now the question is how how hard is it to compute this right here so here you can use the following fact, which is that uh, trace of A, B, where A and B are n by n matrices, is can be computed in order of n squared time. So to compute the trace of a matrix is just a linear operation. It's just order of n. Uh, but to compute the multiplication is, uh, in general, is n cubed. But when we're doing the trace of the multiplication, we're just looking at the diagonal entries. That's just n squared multiplications that you have to do. So you have something like to compute each of these, to compute each of these traces is something like order of uh, the size of these matrices squared. So uh, that turns out to be uh, because these matrices are acting on B qubits, we have that uh, PO can be computed in order of two to the two B. Uh, of course, two to the B is the um, the size of the uh, the matrices of row J and PJ. Okay, and then so you need to iterate this. So this is for one step where we do U1, Z1, and then you can keep on going. Uh, so I will spare you guys the expense, but more or less, if you do D steps of this, if you do D such steps, I said, uh, maybe I did N here, this should be D. steps, you have that you can compute uh, the following probabilities, M1 to MD can be computed in something like M2 to the 2B plus 2D. So you see that it's, it's exponential in the number of sort of qubits and operations that you're acting on. Okay. 
Unfortunately, maybe I will uh, discuss some of this stuff for the next time because I'm running out of time. There's also another um, important case where we have non-stabilizer. Uh, non-stabilizer gates are interesting precisely because uh, going from uh, the Clifford operations to just one extra non-stabilizer gate, for example, the T gate gives you universal quantum computation. So you kind of know that you should have something that's uh, not polynomial in the number of non-Clifford gates. Uh, and this is ex exactly what you sort of get. So I'll just sort of sketch out the, the setup. And in future talks, we're going to discuss how you can actually refine these algorithms. So there's papers by Bravi, Smolin, and Graham, if I'm not mistaken, where they sort of build off of these basic ideas by looking at low numbers of non-Clifford gates and trying to estimate the complexity of the simulation based on the number of those uh, T, state, T gates, for example. So uh, we consider D non-stabilizer gates. Uh, and each where each acts on at most uh, on at most B qubits. Uh, so, and also we start with a stabilizer state. So our input state could be something like one over two to the N product. Uh, dispensing with, so the main complication here that ends up happening and the, the main ingredient is that you wanna take a such a unitary and write it in the poly basis. So you wanna write it as say L, C, L, P, L, something like this. Uh, and this takes at most, so for, so you expand this on the polys acting on B qubits. So this requires, uh, four to the B terms. Uh, so then when I compute the update, U row I, U dagger, this is going to have something like four to the two B terms. And what I'm gonna have to do uh, in general is, so you expand it out, you see that there's all these terms, and what you have to do is keep track of all of these complex coefficients and the additional polys. And so that adds to the complexity. Uh, and then you can also consider measurements. Um, so that this is already quite a bit. And then also just, I will, for the measurements, mm, I will just give the punchline, I guess, in this case, which is that the time and space complexity when everything, so I don't need to, so the whole thing, there's a way to handle measurements. Uh, it's of course more difficult because now the outcomes of the measurements will not be uniform uh, because you have these coefficients. And when you uh, use the Born rule, you'll find that the, you have to flip a biased coin to get a measurement outcome uh, more or less. So you can write that the complexity of this simulation is 2BD times N plus N squared. So you see in, in fact that you do have this exponential scaling. So like I said, in future weeks, uh, we will discuss how you might be able to do better by introducing some other ideas like the stabilizer rank. Uh, next week, we will be talking about uh, something very interesting. So, uh, so paper by, so maybe I write it like this. 
next week uh, will be paper by Bravi and Kataev about magic states. And these are states that when you insert them into your circuit and just use otherwise Clifford operations, you can promote your circuit to a universal quantum computation. Uh, basically, you can consume these magic states by measuring them, and it's like performing a T gate. Uh, this is sort of related to people who remember the uh, measurement based quantum computation where you're teleporting gates. So it's something analogous to that. And so it'll be very interesting to see how that works. So I look for any questions. Okay, sounds good. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, let me at least end the recording.